If you go to your Bibles to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. Paul, in his later letter to the church in Galatia, uh, began his letter not by his normal way of greeting the recipients of his letter, as he had done with the other letters, but he, right in the, right in the beginning, basically told them what was in his heart. And he said this, he said, if anyone preaches to you a different gospel other than we, we preach to you, he said, let him be, and he used the word anathema, let him be damned forever. Let him be cursed forever. And even if an angel from heaven brings to you a gospel other than what you receive from us, let him be anathema, let him be cursed forever. The gospel is the reason the church of the Lord Jesus Christ exists. It is, it is a word that means the good news. It is normally a word that refers to a, a messenger from the battlefield bringing the good news that that the, the war had been won or a battle had been won. And this is the great news of what happened to the church and gloriously as the Holy Spirit birthed the church and they exploded from Jerusalem literally through persecution. They were doing well in, in Jerusalem and, and God allowed persecution to happen to them and they extended all the way to the north and headed all the way to, into Antioch and we saw Paul's first missionary journey. Uh, taking him all the way up to uh, Antioch in Pisidia and then going to the area of where Lystra and Derbe are and, and uh, Iconium and the word of God was spreading, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ was spreading and there was this great thing that was going on because it wasn't just for the Jewish people anymore, it wasn't just, it was never for them alone anymore but it was now of course at the church in Antioch where Barnabas went up to check what was going on and he passed through the church and he got Saul to help him pass through the church and they were uh, ordained to basically take the gospel uh, to, the, to, to the Gentiles around them and they, they went. We saw the church as the first mixed group of people, the Jews and the Gentiles together as, as Paul said in, his, in his, uh, one of his letters. Uh, he said, now the wall of hostility has been, has been brought down between the two, separating the Ephesians. It, he talks about that. And, and of course, to a Jew, that has a lot of meaning because of what even how the temple was, was organized. But in every preaching of the gospel, then and today, there was a problem. Because there were people who did not believe that the gospel is simply what the Bible talks about, which is the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is God's work of redemption that He accomplished through His Son, Jesus Christ. Somehow, the Jewish believers at the time had it kind of mixed up with their ideas. So they had this different version of Christianity. And it's still it's the same today. We have people today who will say, we believe in grace, but grace plus baptism is what saves you. Grace plus speaking in tongues is what saves you. Grace plus the law. If you follow the law, if you observe the... And for us as Gentiles, most of us, I don't know if anybody here from a Jewish background, most of us are Gentiles here. We... we I don't know why we would even be enamored with going back to Judaism or, or, or taking on the, the rules and the, the regulations of Judaism with the Sabbath rules and and the feasts and, and all of that. When they finished their work in chapter 14, and they went back to Antioch, they began to report to the believers what had happened. And in chapter 15, verse 1, it says, Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers. Now, I know you have the map there of the uh, first missionary journey. Uh, I just want to make a point of this. It is always interesting when, if you if you know the geography, to think in terms of uh, to think in terms of Antioch being on the north and and Jerusalem and Judea being on the south. And yet it says some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers. Of course, Jerusalem is an elevated area. But it's not only that, it was also the, the, the center of Christianity at the time.
time. That's where he was birthed. And of course, even in Judaism, it's the same thing. It was the center of the worship of God. And so it was always, you were always going up to Jerusalem, and you're always coming down to Jerusalem. And so some men, and it's right here, Syria is right here. There's Antioch. And of course, Jerusalem is, is in this area, and Judea is in this area. So some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers. And this is what they were teaching. It said, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. So there was this, they were reporting the, of what God had been doing, saving the Gentiles as they preached the gospel, the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ, that redemption had come, salvation has come, and it's by faith alone, and it's by grace alone. Sola gracia. Grace alone, sola fide, faith alone. Nothing that man can do. There is nothing that man in his, in our wickedness, in our sin and trespasses can do to earn salvation. And that was what was proclaimed to the Gentiles and a lot of them were coming to know the Lord. But there were those from Judea to Antioch, uh, went from Judea to Antioch and were telling the believers, unless you are circumcised, what was circumcision? Circumcision was a sign of the old covenant for the people of God. It says, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. And so they were saying almost like you have to first be a Jewish proselyte. You have to convert to Judaism before you, then you can become a believer. And what happened was, verse 2, this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute. Some of your translations would say dissension. And it's the word that is the same word that is used in, in, in Acts chapter 19 in verse 40, when the city clerk, when there was a riot in Ephesus, and he was talking about the rioting. And it's not a strong word that, that's used here, but there was this is not like a mild disagreement between Paul and Barnabas and this, this Judaizers who were in Antioch teaching that salvation is not by grace alone, but you have to be circumcised according to the laws of Moses. And so what did they do? What did the church do? Paul and Barnabas, verse 2, were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. So they wanted to send a delegation. The church sent them on their way and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria. You still have that map there, Richard? Phoenicia and Samaria, of course, are... Uh, Phoenicia, and this is the area of Phoenicia. Phoenicia, of course, was a, the old, uh, where, where the Philistines were, Tyre and Sidon and those areas. Samaria is the northern part. Actually, it's in the middle part of the, the region, uh, just above Judea. And as they met the believers who had, they had encountered before and come to know Christ, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the brothers very glad. So people were excited about the news that Gentiles were coming to know Christ. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. So pretty much the whole church welcomed them. The whole church and the apostles and the elders were excited about what God was doing. But, verse 5, that some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required and be required to obey the law of Moses. Someone said one time that in a church, in any given church, it takes three to five people to start the whole congregation. Actually, it takes less than that, from my experience. That that small number of people can cause a rift that is why the way they did it here was a biblical way of dealing with issues. It was done in the open. It was discussed. And as we will see the pattern of how they did it, we will see how, how, they, came, how they arrived at their conclusions. But basically these guys were talking about that these believers must first be circumcised and they must also follow the laws, the laws of Moses. Now, before you get too harsh, and I'll be honest, when I was studying this, 
I tried to put myself in the shoes or in the sandals of these Pharisees. And I was trying to understand where they're coming from. And the only thing I could come up with, really, was this. And maybe you can identify with these guys. Some of you who may have been, uh, who may have grown up uh, a certain way in the church. And when things begin to change, when there are some changes in the church, there is a reaction, a negative reaction emotionally, especially. Sometimes you don't understand, and you may not be able to explain uh, 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 from your mind for correct reasoning what was going on. But you, you just know that you just don't like it because it's something that is different. I remember our church when we started mentioning years ago about having elders in our church. And I've had people in our church say, I've been a Baptist for 50 years. I've never heard of such a thing. Of course, I was nice. I didn't say, so have you been reading your Bible? Because it's in the Bible. It's in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. But it's, it's very hard at times to change things. I remember one summer evening we were here. This is years ago. Uh, we, it was in the afternoon and we were waiting. And we used to have an evening uh, worship service here. And I was out here with, with a couple of guys. And one guy told me, he said, you know, Lathan, one of the things we need to do, we need to do a, a brush arbor revival. And I looked at him and I said, do you know why they did brush arbor revivals in those days? I said, well, they were neat. I said, well, you have, have you ever been in one? No, I just read about it. But do you know why they did it? They said, well, actually, no. I said they did it because most of the facilities in those days did not have air conditioning. And it was hot in the summer. And so in the summer, when they would have revivals, they would put up a brush arbor. Uh, how many of you do not know what brush arbor is? Oh, my goodness. No, brush arbor. You've got stakes, you've got poles. And it's a structure, it's open on four sides. And then we normally just put like only some leaves or something on the top. And so it's, it's, the wind is just blowing, the breeze is just going through it. And so people can sit in those, uh, 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 under those things uh, comfortably without being so hot in a, in a room with their air conditioning. That's why they did it that way. It had nothing to do with it. Times we get so enamored with the form rather than the substance. And that's what we've done, what's, what's happened. A lot of the forms that we have today have been taken from really even non-Christian non, non backgrounds. And, and it's okay, the form is okay, so long as it's not, it doesn't distract us or detract from the message. But the most important thing is always the essence, the substance, the message that we carry. It's not an affinity to brush arbors, it's not an affinity to tent revivals. It's an affinity, it must be a commitment to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And these guys, I've, I've thought about this, why, why they were doing this. Now these were Pharisees, notice. In, notice in verse 5, some of the believers, they were believers, these were Christians, who belonged to the party of the Pharisees. They were part of a small group of Pharisees. And, and I thought about that, and I thought about how Pharisees, how they came to be. Well, every Jew, especially the boys, they would go through Hebrew school. They would memorize the books of Moses. And then, of course, that's how they, they, they lived their lives, and every week they had the Sabbath. They observed the Sabbath at, at, sun, at sundown on, on Friday to sundown on, on Saturday. And there were some... They practiced the feasts uh, of, of, the, of Israel, the seven feasts of Israel. And everything pointed to who they were. The, the laws of Moses, the feasts, the Sabbath observances, the sacrifices that they had, the prayers that they had were all highlighting for them. That salvation was going to, that God was going to bring salvation. But these were all, these were all things that has been so much a part of their inner being, their, their, their thoughts and their patterns, their lives. And then they come to, to their bar mitzvah, these guys who became Pharisees, and they became sons of the law, and they were, uh, they were celebrating, the whole community was celebrating, and actually, even when they were circumcised on the eighth day, it was a big to-do, it wasn't like something that's normally done for Gentiles, where 
child is born, a boy is born, and they just, they just do it at the hospital. It's a big uh, religious celebration, even the circumcision. And then they get to the bar mitzvah, and then after that, the guys who want to be Pharisees who are being trained, they train some more. And, and, and I don't know if you know this, but the, the chapters and the verses that we have, they were given by men, but the, the, the Old Testament that they had didn't have the chapters and verses. And so they, they learn the scriptures. They learn it by memory. And so they can quote scriptures in the same way that Jesus would quote scriptures. And he would remove one passage of scripture. And for instance, when John the Baptist asked his disciples, would you, when he was thrown in prison, says, would you ask him if he was really the Messiah? And Jesus answered by quoting him Isaiah 61. You and I can say Isaiah 61. But Jesus simply said to them, his, to, to his disciples, he said, well, tell him. Basically what he was doing. That, he, that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. But he omitted one part of Isaiah 61 that we find in Luke chapter 4, which is that the prisoners would be set free. And it was a message to, to John the Baptist that he was going to be in jail. I am the Messiah, but you're going to be still in prison. And see, that's how they were. And so, when they became Pharisees, this was not like something that haphazardly happened to them. From day one of their birth, they were being geared, they were being taught the laws of God. And so they have this sense of everything must be done in the same way that it had been done. So, okay, that's as far as I'm going to go in trying to understand the Pharisees. Let's go to what the apostles and the elders did. Verse 6, the apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, I love this, and this is by the way the last time we will see Peter in the book of Acts. Peter got up and addressed him. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the message of the gospel, that Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that He accepted them by giving them or giving the Holy Spirit to them just as He did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for He purified their hearts by faith. Now, it must be important enough for Peter. I think this is the fourth time he had mentioned this is, of course, uh, he's referring to Acts chapter 10, the conversion of Cornelius, who was a Gentile. Must have been one of those really neat times for him that he was so impressed, he was so impressed with that, that it seemed like he said it a lot, and he was, gave a testimony, because this was so different for them, for him. And so he tells him that, but I want you also to notice something here, the emphasis that he was making. Which is, by the way, what the Bible emphasizes. And I know it sounds foreign to a lot of us today. Because we sing songs, I don't mean here in our church, but we, there's so many songs and so many works and so many teachings that go on that, it's, that salvation is by human works. It is us trying our best. And then even when we say we believe by grace, that I am saved by grace alone, by faith alone, that somehow I can still just try my best and live my best so that then I can honor God with my life. Well, I want you to see something that, that part of Peter's message. Look at verse 7. He says, Brothers, you know that some time ago, who made a choice among you? What does the text say? Look at the text. Who did it? God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might, might hear from my lips the message of the good news of the, the Evangelion and, and believe. And then look at verse 8. God, who knows the heart, showed, God showed, that He, God, accepted them by giving them, God was the one who gave the Holy Spirit to them, just as He did to us. And God made no distinction between us and them, for He purified their hearts by faith. Probably referring to, to the passage in Ezekiel, when God says, I will take from you the nations, or I will, take from, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. Then listen to this. He says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Uh, a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes. And be careful to obey my rules. 
You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. <laughs> See, Peter understood something that often is lost amongst the modern evangelicals today. That it is God's work, salvation is primarily, ultimately, and in between God's work. We have responsibilities of walking with Him. But it's the righteousness of Christ that lives in us. That is unleashed when we, when our minds have changed, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that we present, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Sacrifices are normally dead. This is because we are living, as Peter says, we are living stones. Living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And it says, stop letting the world, verse 2 says, stop letting the world squeeze you into its mold. But be changed, be transformed. How? By trying your best? By doing more spiritual calisthenics? No. It is just be, be changed by the renewing of your mind. How do we renew our minds? It is through the Word of God taught us by His Holy Spirit who lives in us. And it's then that Christ who lives in us, His righteousness and His holiness and the life that is in us is released from us. Our minds are changed, our hearts are changed. And then it affects the way we think and affects the, the actions that we have. And you know, I, I, I'll tell you, one of the saddest things that I've seen in Christianity is people would begin by faith, as Paul says to the church in Galatia. And then they just want to live by, by the law. Well, you can't do that. But it's clear in Ezekiel's uh, prophecy that it is God who's going to do it. And, and Peter made, made a point of saying that. Verse 10, now then, why do you, he asks the people, why do you test why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? Same language that is used in, in, uh, in Exodus 17 when they tested God in, in the wilderness. And he's saying, why, why, why would you put a yoke on, on their necks that you and I can't even, can't even do as Jewish people? They couldn't do it. And yet they want to put it on somebody else. This is why do you test God like that. He says, no, he says, no, we believe, listen to this, and I think I've got some of these things here, uh, Richard. Uh, he said, this is, this is a tremendous point that he makes here, look at verse 11, no, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they were, just as they are, it is through the grace. It is simply, grace is the same word that's translated as gift. It is translated also as favor, the same word. And it's simply a gift from God. Listen, Christmas, and I, I love Christmas. When you receive a present, a gift from, uh, at Christmas, do you say, oh honey, thank you so much. I love this. I love How did you know I, I wanted this for Christmas? And then you hug her neck, and, or his neck, and... And you kiss them, and, and, and then you pull out your billfold. And says, how much do I owe you for this? No, grace is free. It's already been paid for. Guys, salvation is what God did through His Son, Jesus Christ. It is a gift of God. It is a gift from God. Paul says this in, second, in Ephesians 2. It is by grace you have been saved. It is by the gift of God that you have been saved. And this not of yourselves. It says, so that no man can boast. Because if we are able to say how, how early I get up in the morning so I can impress God with how early I get up and read my Bible or how many times I, I, I come to church and I've got, a, Lord, have you seen my son and Baptist record? I've got a perfect attendance in Sunday school and in church. I tie to them. To the nth degree. But, but salvation is not that. Salvation is what God did. And that is why I've, I've reminded our church many times. When you give your testimonies, search out your heart. Search out really where, look back at what happened to you. Because when I hear testimonies of people saying, yeah, when I was 10, I walked down the aisle. I'm asking about your salvation. You're telling me about what you did. Or, I said a sinner's prayer. I'm asking about your salvation. You're telling me what you did. What Salvation is what God did. 
And he's simply receiving what God has already done to his son. When Jesus died on that cross, and he was buried, and he was raised and ascended into, into the right hand side of the Father, the work is done. There is nothing that you and I can do. We are beggars simply at the mercy of God. In fact, we were, we, we were dead in our sins and our trespasses. We didn't even know we were lost until God the Holy Spirit stirred up in our hearts an understanding of our lostness. And how dare us think that there is something that we can do to earn salvation. That we can be good enough. So he says, no, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved. Just as they were. And you can hear probably a pin drop, verse 12, the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul. Telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God has done among the Gentiles through them. So what Peter said, Paul and Barnabas verified with their testimony and the report that they gave to the church. Verse 13, when they finished, James spoke up. Now who was James? James was the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7, that the Lord appeared to him after his, after his resurrection. He was called, he was considered by historians as the first bishop of the church in Rome. I'm sorry, not Rome. Jerusalem, he was in Jerusalem. He was not in Rome. Uh, first, uh, first church in, in Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem. Uh, they said, they called him J uh, James the Just because of his piety. And according to tradition, that when he died, they found that his knees were like the knees of a camel because he spent so much time praying. This was a man who probably, didn't, we know from the scriptures, did not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ until he was converted and he saw the, the risen Lord and he became a leader in the church. Well, you'd think, probably those present here, the Judaizers, the, the Pharisees who believed that you need to be circumcised and or the Gentiles needed to be circumcised and follow the laws of Moses, they probably were thinking, hey, James is going to get up. He's the lead elder and he's going to defend our side. Well, look at what he says. Keep in mind what, what Peter has already said and what Barnabas and Paul have already spoken about. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written. And he was quoting from Amos. And he said this, After this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, and the remnant of men may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things that have been known for the ages. Now what was he just doing? When, when we have discussions, especially doctrinal issues, you can have the testimony of Peter and what the Holy Spirit did. And sure enough, he, he was, there was some, some language there of uh, referring to scriptures. But he was talking about what happened in Acts chapter 10 about Cornelius and his household getting saved. And he said that, and then Paul and Barnabas get, get up, and they talked about what also had God, God had done through and what they had seen, miracles and signs and wonders that God had performed as they preach the gospel. But the most sure source of truth is not experience, but the Word of God. And that is why James gets up and tells them what their scriptures have already said from the book of Amos. And so, this is what he was trying to, to get them to see. It's not the only text. I mean, he, he mentions from from Amos chapter 9. But listen to these other passages. Zechariah chapter 2 verse 11. He said, And many nations shall join themselves to the Lord, to Yahweh in that day, and shall be my people. And I will dwell in their midst, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 2. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills. And all the nations, all of the nations shall flow into it. And then Paul in his letter to the church in Rome, listen to this. Because he quotes several passages in the Old Testament as he tells them what God was doing. He says, therefore, he talk, he's talking about welcoming one another. He says, therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. 
For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. As it is written, and then he quotes from 2 Samuel in Psalm 18, he says, Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, and then he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 32, Rejoice, rejoice O Gentiles, with His people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol Him. Psalms 117 verse, verse 1. And again he says, and he quotes Isaiah chapter 11 verse 10, The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. What was Paul saying? What was James saying? That this, the conversion of the Gentiles was not something that was foreign to the Scriptures. God has already said it. In fact, when God promised to, Ab to Abraham in chapter 12, when he made his covenant, what did he say? You will be a father of what? Did he say one nation? Of many nations. Now, you're probably thinking, well, that's a nice lesson on biblical history. But you know, today we treat we kind of had reverse the process. We treat Jews as the Jews, some of the Jews tried to treat the Gentiles at the time. Now we want the Jews who are coming to know the faith, coming to know Christ. We want them to, to give up their Jewishness so then it would look like the Gentile church. Not only that, those of us who say, for, for instance, here in, in West Texas, we think this is what Christianity is. And there's nothing wrong with how we do things, but this is what it is, and, and, uh, and so we will be uh, struggling, for instance, with our brothers and sisters in, in some parts of the world who are former Muslims, who do not meet on Sundays, but meet on Fridays, because that, to them, that's their holy day, and they meet on Fridays. And somehow we would, and I have seen this, I've been in other parts of the world, but I've seen this, and I, if you had blindfolded me uh, from here in San Angelo, and, Taken off my blindfold in either in Mexico or parts of uh, Central America uh, and South America, I would say I was still in West Texas. Because what we try to do is we try to make people look like us. And in fact, even here in our culture here, we would say, okay, uh, this is how we are in this church, this is how we're supposed to be, and we dress a certain way, and we do certain things, and you cannot, and then we, we start adding things to it. Listen. The gospel is by the grace of God alone. How we live our lives. I want you to understand this. I heard Dr. Swindoll say this one time. It's okay for you and for me to come up with our rules and regulations of how we're supposed to act. And I'm not talking about, uh, I'm talking about the disputable matters that he's talking about. In the book of Romans, in Romans 14. Some of you may, may drink wine, some of you may not. Oops, did I just say something about wine in the Baptist church? You know, if, if, it's, if it's offensive to someone, you know, don't do it. First Corinthians talks about that, Paul talks about that. But care enough about your weaker brothers and sisters about that. But, but understand, we accept each other on the basis of who we are, on the basis of who Christ is. And not on the basis of what it is that we like to do and what we're comfortable with in terms of the form of the religion that we practice. I heard Dr. Swindle again say one time, he said, you know, he said, it's okay for you to come up with your own lists, just don't hand them to someone else for someone else to follow. It's okay. Well, James says in verse 19, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by animals, from sexual immorality, literally the word is porneia, from the meat of strangled animals and from blood. Now, you might say when you first read this, you're thinking, well, yeah, you've got to tell them to avoid sexual immorality. But, but really, the context of what he's talking about here, the first thing that he mentioned, Listen to this, guys, because this, this affects really how these people were thinking. 
It is not that they were adding to the gospel, okay? They were wanting them to be sensitive to the, or to be careful about the sensitivities of their Jewish brothers and sisters. Okay? And notice the first thing that he mentions. He says, instead we should write to them, telling them to abstain from, the NIV says, food polluted by idols. It, it identifies what, what it is, but it really just simply says things. Uh, polluted by idols. It doesn't have to be food. Because there was so much idol worship in the pagan world amongst the Gentiles that food is, of course, one. Uh, Paul uh, has to, had to deal with that in 1 Corinthians. And, but it's contaminated by idols. And then the idea of immorality here, sexual immorality, also probably has to do with uh, sexual immorality that is connected with pagan rites. And I've mentioned this to you all before, the worship of the woman and the child from the time of Semiramis and, and Tammuz in, in, in the time of Nimrod after his death and, and, and Tammuz. All the way to where we are today in parts of the world where they worship the woman and the child. It is still practiced in the same way with sexual orgies. And that's what they, they were talking about. And when it speaks of the strangled things, strangled things, probably also has to do with the way they killed animals. The word for strangled here is the same word that is used uh, in, in like the drowning of the pigs or, or in, in the parable of, of the, the soil when, when it says there's some plants that grow up and then there's some weeds that grow up and choke. It's the same word that is used there. It's used for strangled here. And, and, but it's the idea of how, they, how the pagans killed their animals. And they didn't even cook them properly. And so probably there was some leftover blood. And of course the, the, the prohibitions in Leviticus of how they're not supposed to eat blood. Now, I'll, I have a confession to make. I was, I'm, a, I'm a Gentile, as most of you are, also are. Now, I know you think I'm weird because I like balloon, which is duck egg that's developing, and you boil it, and it's, it's good stuff, but you think that's gross. But you guys also like it. Blue cheese, and I think that's gross. <laughs> but listen, for for me when I was growing up, it was nothing for us, for for my parents, for my mom, to kill a chicken and drain the blood, put the blood in, mix with with the with the dish. It was a delicacy, and there's actually uh, I don't see. Uh, Nelson here, but Nelson is married to a Filipina, and there's a dish called dinuguan. Dugo literally means blood, and it's cut up pork with other things, and that is boiled in the blood with other mixture. Now, I know that the roast is not, but it's a delicacy. Now, what what Paul is saying is this: be sensitive to your brothers and sisters who are of Jewish background. It doesn't change the gospel but I want you to be sensitive to them. So they sent the letter. Not only did they send the letter, but they also sent some of the uh, people with uh, Paul and Barnabas. What was that for? It was so that they could attest to what the letter was about. That this is really from, from James and the apostles and the elders. And this is the letter that, that they sent. This is to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Cilicia. Readings, we have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you troubling your minds for what they said, so we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends, Barnabas and Paul, a man who have risen their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth that what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. Again, this does not change the law. I mean, the, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are to abstain from food, sacrifice to idols, from blood, the meat of strangled animals and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. The men were sent off and went down to Antioch where they gathered the church together, delivered the letter. The people read it and they were glad because they were expecting probably something different. They were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the brothers. After spending some time there, they were sent off, they were sent off by the brothers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. They never stopped. It didn't matter what was going on in their lives, they just continued preaching the word of the Lord. Let me just give you three things for us this week. 
close this morning. Three truths that we can get from this section. Number one, salvation by grace alone is a foundational biblical truth and must never be compromised. Guys, and I, I'll tell you, you may say this, but a lot of times I hear it from people. Yeah, I believe that. But you know, we've got this event going on in San Angelo. It's just all the Christians here in town. I mean, Christians who sacrifice, who sacrifice what Christ has said in the Word, what He has done, who deny the, the very work of Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, His burial, His death, His burial, and His resurrection, and we say it's okay? No, it is not okay. We cannot confuse the lost people in San Angelo by simply saying, I believe in myself, and this is grace alone, faith alone, in Christ alone, and then go out there and just say, hey, we're all one brother, one happy family. No, we're not. If there's anything that will make a distinction between us and other people, is, is if we stand on the truth of who God is, and we cannot simply pay lip service to the Word of God and say, and we're, we're just going to be nice. I, I don't have time for church history right now, but I was tempted to, but I'm annoyed. Because I've heard it from some of you. I've heard from some of you. I mean, there are denominations in this town who deny the finished work of Christ. Who would add, for instance, baptism or speaking in tongues to the work of Jesus Christ. And we think it's okay. And we think it's okay. Because they go to church. And that's how we define Christianity. They go to church. Well, Mormons go to church. Muslims go to church. Uh, Jews go to church. And I'm not saying we hate them. No, we don't hate them, but we don't want to confuse them. Listen, if, and I've said this before, if you, if everybody's dying of cancer and you have the medication, you have the antidote for cancer, and you have it, would you not love your neighbor, your families, your friends, your co-workers enough to tell them the truth? They might say, hey, I, I, I like Oreos. They say it treats cancer. Or whatever it is. Would you not tell them? He says, no. Here is the only cure for cancer. Is it, is it respecting and loving them? He says, you know, I'm not going to hurt their feelings. By telling them this is what really will cure their cancer. Second thing is faith means relying solely on what God has already done and said in the word. Not adding anything to it. So we simply trust God. That's what faith is. Like beggars, we simply receive what He's offering us. Third, in Christian fellowship, grace and love must be shown for our differences that are not central to the gospel truth. If it doesn't affect the foundational truth of who we are, and we differ about them, it's okay. John Newton, author of Amazing Grace, said this, is it an iron pillar in essentials and a reed in non-essentials? So somebody likes to wear shorts to church. Some of you are going, I can't believe you said that from the pulpit, but you will allow people to wear shorts. You know, I, I wish, my prayer is that we become more passionate about the things that really matter, about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I, what do we have as followers of Christ? I, I have nothing to give you. You and I have nothing to give the world except Christ. That's all we have. He's all we have. What are we going to offer them? College hills? Or how we do things? As a Southern Baptist? I mean, what is that? I mean, I love being Southern Baptist. Some of you were born Southern Baptists. I chose to be a Southern Baptist because I believe in the Word of God and in missions. But listen, what defines us as Southern Baptists, what defines who we are, is who Christ is and what He's done for us. The Gospel, the good news. And we joyously, faithfully, and simply proclaim who He is. Uncontaminated by any of human words, we simply thank God for the work that He's done.